The disability rights movement started in the 50s, a time where buildings didn't have ramps and there wasn't any braille on signs, a time where you could be removed from school if your IQ was below 50, and you could be arrested or fined if you were disabled and out in public view because of ugly laws. NARC was created in the 1950s as a reaction towards this discrimination towards kids with low IQs. NARC provided services like counseling for parents, classes, and social groups. However, the disability rights movement didn't really take off until the 1960s after the Civil Rights Act, which outlawed discrimination against black people. The disability rights movement took a lot of inspiration from the civil rights movement, especially since it happened right after it. In 1968, the Architectural Barriers Act, ABA, was passed. It stated that any building funded by federal government must be accessible to everyone, including people with disabilities. In 1973, the 504 was written into law. It made it so that any program funded by federal government could not discriminate against disabled people. It had been approved in everything. It just needed things like definitions and regulations. It also needed the signature of Joseph A. Califano Jr., the Secretary of Hue, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. However, Hue was working to weaken the 504, and Califano wasn't signing it. Soon, 1974 came. No signature. 1975, no signature. 1976, no signature. 1977, no signature. Around that time, the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities was formed, the ACCD. The ACCD realized who was trying to stop the 504, so they demanded that the 504 be put into action by April 4th, or they would respond with sit-ins. A sit-in is where people go and sit around a building or place that they're protesting and just wait there until what they want to get done gets done. It's a form of protest mirrored by the civil rights movement. When Martin Luther King took a bunch of protesters to a courthouse to protest voting discrimination towards black people. April 4th came and went, but the 504 collected dust on Califano's desk. It was time for a sit-in. But this sit-in wasn't just off the cuff. It was thoroughly planned since April 5th, and committees were set up within the ACCD. Committees that focused on things like public speakers, media, fundraising, medics, publicity, and connecting with other groups. They were able to get the support of churches, LGBT groups, civil rights groups, and politicians. It was all planned out that way. Hearkening back to Rosa Parks, before her, there was an unplanned bus protest, but it didn't get any attention at all. Rosa Parks was an avid civil rights activist, and her whole story of being tired on the bus was planned to get media attention and sympathy. And it worked wonders, because for most people, when they hear the word civil rights, the first thing they think of is Rosa Parks. The ACCD's planning would definitely increase their chances of getting the 504 into law. On April 5th, synonyms popped up around the U.S., Seattle, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., but no sit-in lasted as long as the one in San Francisco, led by Judy Human. This sit-in is the longest sit-in in all of history. It lasted 28 days, and more than 200 people stayed till the end. They lived and slept in a cramped federal office building for over 28 days. But they didn't even get that much sleep anyway, because they stayed up all night having tactical meetings, planning every last detail, everyone figuring out the right decisions, on meetings that lasted for hours on end. And they talked with the media often, another tactic used by the civil rights movement. After 28 days, Hugh decided to have a meeting with the activists. The testimony of Judy Human, E.D. Roberts, Debbie Kaplan, and Phil Newmark was so compelling that one of the representatives went and locked himself in his office. Cranston was a very important man at that meeting. He was a congressman on Hugh's side. He had objections to every last detail on the 504, but the activists very thoroughly answered each and every one of them. All of this happening on live TV. The last to speak at the meeting was Frank Bow, and he said, Senator, we are not second class citizens. We are third class citizens. And everyone started to cry. Califano finally signed his four-year-old paperwork that gave protections against discrimination for disabled people. Just a year after the month-long sit-in, there was a protest against buses. 
19 kids surrounded a bus with their wheelchairs, stopping it from moving, and they started chanting, we will ride. This sparked more bus protests in 1983. People would not only surround the bus with their wheelchairs, but they would crawl out of their wheelchairs and crawl up into the bus. This worked because in 1990, wheelchair lifts on buses became required by law. The Fair Housing Amendments Act was created. This act detailed how to make any building with four or more living areas accessible to those who are disabled. And this act didn't only affect government-owned buildings, it affected privately-owned buildings too. In 1990, the ADA law was passed, making discrimination against disabled people illegal. And in 2004, the first Disability Pride Parade took place. The disability rights movement is still going on today, and we can learn a lot from it. Impeccable planning for any movement is super important, because without planning, people might look unprofessional or uneducated. Media involvement is also very important because it can get your message out quicker and to more people. And finally, nonviolence is super important because any form of violence that you use in your protests can be used against you to make you look bad and discredit all your arguments. If you are interested in any of the topics discussed in this video, links to all my sources are in the description.